Hello everyone, I'm James Milan. Welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town. I am joined today um, by our state senator, Cindy Friedman. Um, always a joy to have uh, join us here in the studio. Thanks so much for coming in. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. It's nice to be here, as always. As always. Um, we, I wanted, you know, I asked you in because usually we are speaking quarterly, uh, getting legislative updates about <laughs> the many, uh, the many pies that you have your fingers in up, up at the state house, um, and we will get to one of those again shortly, undoubtedly. But um, I was struck uh, about a month ago. You, uh, there was a press release from your office about the passage of the PACT Act, and PACT, P-A-C-T, is the Pharmace Pharmaceutical <laughs> Access, Costs, and Transparency Act. Um, and that came, it would, basically it passed the Senate, right, mm -hmm. in early February. Yes. Um, and uh, I really wanted to take the opportunity, because I know from talking to you from the day that you uh, started as our official state senator, how important this work and this, this subject matter is to you. Um, and I want to take a deep dive. Sure. So Great. I appreciate your taking the time to do so and agreeing to do so. Um, so let me start by asking, just to give people a sense of why are we going to be talking about this for the next half hour, what is so necessary and important about the passage of this particular piece of legislation? Um, so I think if you look at um, what we try and do as a commonwealth, um, in terms of healthcare, um, it's focused on affordability, accessibility, and quality. And we have, um, over the past 10 years, in fact, it's been 10 years, we've put a certain structure in place to help us uh, measure that and also to set a benchmark, especially around the cost. Mm -hmm. um, we have lots of other benchmarks for quality. But cost and accessibility is something that we um, really focus with a lot of measurement. Uh, we, ca we cover insurers, who are the payers. We cover hospitals. Um, so we cover a certain delivery of services. Mm -hmm. What we don't cover and what we haven't looked at is pharmaceuticals. And pharmaceuticals are right now one of the fastest growing um, industries and cost to um, residents. And in fact, I just was recently reading a survey that I think was within the past six or seven months that, um, that found that nine out of 10 people um, in the Commonwealth are worried about being able to afford their drugs. 90%. 90%, wow. nine out of 10. And this has been actually been validated by a number of studies. Mm -hmm. So while we've really focused on our insurers and while we focused on our, on our hospitals and doctors, we have not paid attention to the pharmaceutical industry, which is big and powerful and important and um, a big, uh, it's a lot to take on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just want to say that you were saying right now, this is a, you know, a rapidly growing kind of uh, source of cost escalation. But as far as I know, I mean, I've just been feeling for my entire adult life, like the pharmaceutical yeah. industry and pharmaceuticals in general, prescription drugs, are kind of runaway costs sure. uh, in general. So yeah. trying to get your, your hands around that and, and, and do something about it, again, a daunting task, but right. nonetheless, Critical. clear, measurable progress yeah. here, I think, yeah. right? Yeah. Well. If this bill passes. <laughs> if this bill passes, which you uh, kind of, uh, as usual, uh, you were, you're able, you're one step ahead of me uh, because that is my next question, in fact. Um, what happened in, uh, on February 10th is that the Senate passed this legislation. Um, there is another chamber over yes, there. Yes, there is. We, at the State House. <laughs> which, we, which we ignore at our own peril. But <laughs> right, yes, exactly. Is, uh, <laughs> so what happens next? What, 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 and not only procedurally what happens next, but what's your sense of how things will, will go? Um, so what happens now is that this bill is sitting in House Ways and Means. It's been sent over to them, mm -hmm. and they can take it up. They can take it up exactly how it is. 
they could rewrite it and have their own version and take that up, meaning bring it to the floor. Um, they could put this one out there and with lots of amendments and amend it. Um, and then if that were to happen, they would pass a version. I'm sure it won't be the same exact version as ours. And then we would have to what's called conference it. So three people from the Senate would sit down with three people from the House and they would negotiate the uh, a final bill. Mm -hmm. I know you've been one of those three people from the Senate have, at various points in the past. I have been various points, yes, I yes. know, I have. Um, yeah. And probably will be again when it comes to reconciling this, I assume? Yeah, I mean, I would certainly be part of it. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so, again, if you, if you don't mind, because I get to ask you these kinds of questions and you give me straight answers a lot of the time, what's your sense? Are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic somewhere in between? I think I'm somewhere in between. Um, you know, I have in the past had conversations with House leadership that acknowledges some of the problems that we have. Um, it's always an interesting um, exercise when we talk about pharmaceuticals in this state because we are such a pharmaceutical state. We are, you know, um, uh, biotech is a huge part of our economy mm -hmm. and I think people are always reluctant to take some of these on because of the because of possible consequences mm -hmm. yeah and let's acknowledge I mean the pharmaceutical industry as you say is gigantic yep. and very well insulated in a yep. lot of ways and so you know, and, and this state, however progressive we are, however much we care to reduce the costs for all of us, especially those who can least afford it, et cetera, you know, we also are dependent on right. these kind and, of... And they do good things. They make, you know, they, they make vaccines. That's right. You That's know. right. Um, they do a lot of, you know, there is a lot of really amazing work done, and there's a lot of stuff that is questionable. So let's talk about that because um, in the press release uh, that you put out, you had, you, you know, obviously the bill covers a lot of ground and has a lot of content to it. You chose a few provisions to highlight um, from that bill and I just wanted to kind of dig into a few of those. Um, the first one, and I'm just going to read from sure. the press release, uh, not completely, but for yeah. the first one, it says that um, the most notably, the PACT Act would permanently cap a consumer's out-of-pocket costs for insulin at $25 per 30-day supply. So nobody would have to pay more than $25 in a month for insulin. What struck me, um, and of course there are an awful lot of folks with diabetes out there, um, but what struck me is that there's this is a specific drug that it, right. that you're you're kind of saying planting a flag down. Right. Tell us why. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, um, you cannot live for any period of time without insulin. Um, insulin to um, somebody who uh, has diabetes is like water to us. You, there's just no right. question. So there's no discretion. There's there. no discretion. You don't get to decide. Uh, you can't like exercise or <laughs> change your diet or, you know, mm -hmm. you, right. it is a chronic illness that you are absolutely dependent. Your body is not making something that it is necessary for it to, to continue. So that's number one. Number two is it was a drug that was, I believe, discovered in 1922. It was given to a hospital for $1 for the sole purpose of making sure that everybody could get it. Since 1922, the, the cost of insulin has gone beyond what any of us would imagine. We, I, we were just reading something today. Um, my comms director, Stephen, gave it to me that there is a, a woman, there was a conversation about, I think it was in Commonwealth. She's paying $700 for a three-month supply of insulin, $700 for a drug that is basically not changed, okay? Um, so it, it felt like a, a absolute prime uh, drug to, 
to take on. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, there's some other drugs that are very close behind, you know, EpiPens, um, inhalers, things that we um, think are also very, very important. Um, all the chronic illness drugs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we want to tackle them. Um, this bill, we did the insulin, and we also have done some other things, which is to allow our Health Policy Commission, which oversees the costs of health care, we've now, this bill gives them the authority to look at medications that are essential. So an inhaler is an essential drug. Uh, EpiPens are essential, right? To look at those drugs along with brand new drugs that have a high cost. So either the brand new drug has got a, a, a high cost of over, um, I think it's $25,000 a year, or essential drugs that have gone up a certain percentage. Mm -hmm. And if they, those drugs would now uh, be ripe for them to take a look at, to actually look into what is the true cost of the drug and the value of the drug, and if they find that that is out of line with what a pharmaceutical company is charging, they would then have the ability to sit down with that pharmaceutical company and work to bring that cost down. Um, so what I hear you saying then is that for these categories of drugs, either essential or ones that are expensive, expensive uh, to manufacture, then of course expensive to pay for, um, that you basically want to have an opportunity to d go to that T in PACT, right? The transparency, at the very least, to be able to say, why is that? Right. Show us, right. and then let's talk about right. Let, let's how talk did you about get how that can, cost? What mm -hmm. is that cost mm -hmm. contained here? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, that's exactly what the, you know, uh, and what we find is that there are drugs out there that are extremely expensive. And, and when you do an independent review of them, you find out that uh, that's why they're expensive. They're expensive because they're incredibly expensive to make, because they have such a profound effect on the health of a group of people. Um, and so the cost is warranted, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think somebody, if you look at some of the research, there are something like, and I don't even want to tell you the number, but it's hundreds of drugs that are on formularies, which are the lists that insurers keep of what drugs they pay for and what drugs they don't. Mm -hmm. but they're on formularies that have not proven to be effective for anything. Mm -hmm. And yet, mm -hmm. they're dispensed, people pay for them, and there's no information or evidence that says they have value. Yeah, and you know we've already noted pharmaceutical companies, big and small, biotech companies, huge for our economy here in Massachusetts, but also that narrative, what you were just saying, you want to be able to, to, to basically, this legislation uh, pushes us towards being able to say, okay, your narrative is consistently that, wow, the costs of, dis of discovery, the costs of, you know, just doing all of this stuff up front that we, the pharmaceutical company bears, we now have to it's only right that we have a chance right. to make that back. I've heard that argument hundreds of times, I'm sure right. everybody has. Right. And what you're saying, I think, here is, okay, show, yeah. you know, just- Show just, me, how'd you get yeah. to it? You yeah, know? just, and, and if it's if that's the case, okay, we agree. We're, we're, but, and we're then, good you know, shape. I think right. what we, right. we might find out how often that's the case yeah. or not. Um, so on the issue of transparency, I just want to, because you just covered the, the second of the, of the five provisions that you had laid out, uh, I wanted to go to the third, which, which deals, basically it says that it directs the state to collect a range of information around drug costs from pharmaceutical manufacturers and from pharmacy benefit managers, or PBMs, um, basically allowing both policymakers, folks in the government, and consumers, because we could then see this, right. Right. Um, to better understand the role that both of these play in driving prescription drug costs. So can you explain um, for us as succinctly as possible, what is the role, I think people understand and we've talked about, okay, the manufacturers, they're making the stuff. What about these pharmacy benefit managers? What is their role? So a pharmacy benefit manager should be thought about like a middleman. They, they negotiate, this is very high level, 
They negotiate on behalf of the insurers with the, with the pharmaceutical companies and the pharmacies, right? They also interact with the pharmacies mm -hmm. um, to get the uh, best value for the insurers, okay? Right, their Good job, point. Important their job point. is to negotiate because it's, it's a, as we've said, it's hugely complicated. There's enormous amount of information. And over time, insurers have sort of carved out this, the pharmacy benefit mm -hmm. is what it is. And the pharmaceutical, the, the PBMs are responsible for that. Now, the PBMs are thing, you know, like CVS, um, you know, Silver Scripts, Express Scripts, um, those are things we all have heard about. Those are the, those are the benefit managers. Um, mm -hmm. They also negotiate rebates. Um, the problem is, is that A, they have absolutely no um, regulatory authority that they have to answer to. So they are not licensed. They do not need to be licensed. And B, we have no idea no idea of what's behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. um, we know that pharmacy costs are going up. We know that these companies do incredibly well. Um, we don't know how those negotiations um, affect the premiums or the costs that we pay. We know nothing about that. And so what this, what this bill is doing is it's saying, PBMs, number one, you have to be licensed, and number two, you have to be part of our cost trends hearings. And the cost trend hearing is where we um, actually look at and, and determine whether our benchmarks for healthcare costs increase are being met. Mm -hmm. And right now, pharmaceuticals companies don't have to be part of that, and PBMs don't have to be part of it. Insurers are, hospitals are, and so we need to bring them into this process to get to truly understand what our healthcare costs are. Right, because they are a prime player, as you've already they are outlined. A huge player. And to not know that right. about right. a prime pl player in this whole scenario right. is right. just doesn't make any sense. Right, and they are becoming, they're going from being PBMs to becoming kind of providers. You know, you can go to a CVS Minute Clinic. Walgreens getting into the primary care business. You know, mm -hmm. all of these um, entities are kind of merging in a way that we should be very, very cognizant of. Mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of money to be made. Amen. Um, so mo moving on, we've got just two more things I want to talk about. Um, one is that it says that the PACT Act will establish a trust fund to provide financial assistance for prescription drugs that treat chronic illness. Now, again, you talked about drugs that treat chronic, chronic illness a little earlier. Clearly, these are absolutely societally, right. these are absolutely essential drugs right. um, for all of us because you know, could could happen, could befall any of us that sure. we are dependent on these. Um, so what do you mean by providing financial assistance? To whom will that uh, assistance go? And where's that money going to come from for the trust fund? So th there's a, okay, so first off, um, the WHO and um, the, uh, one, and, and the CDC, places like that, um, organizations like that, they have a list of what are essential drugs and the definition of what an essential drug is. Mm -hmm. um, and there are numbers of drugs that are across the board, they're, they're, they're used by so many people, like blood pressure, right, mm -hmm. is a really good one, like mm -hmm. lots of people are on blood pressure mm -hmm. um, medication. Um, so what this would say is that if you are if you meet a certain financial level, and, and it really is for the people that are not poor enough to be on mass health mm -hmm. and not wealthy enough to, <laughs> to, not have to, to be worry able about to, it right, to, to um, actually be able to afford their medication, mm -hmm. that that set of people would have access to chronic care drugs that they need at low, um, at low cost. In fact, the Health Connector, Massachusetts, which is our sort of version of the uh, um, 
public option, mm -hmm. has just announced that they will have, um, that there will not be co-pays and deductibles for certain chronic illness drugs, mm. okay? And that's amazing. And everybody should look at the Health Connector. Everybody should go um, and check that out because they are really incredible and there's some good plans there. But anyway, that's, the purpose of this is to provide some way while we figure this out, mm -hmm. um, for people to be able to have access to those drugs. And that's what the trust fund would do. Now, part of that money is gonna be state funded and we will push for that. And part of that money will come from fines um, that, ha that are levied on pharmaceutical and PBM companies who do not engage in providing us information that we are requesting. Okay, so I see. So both the enforcement of the requirements that they do so and the funding of this trust fund comes from the same, at least in part, from right. the same source, it, it, well, which will yeah. be, how do you enforce those things? You right. find the companies right. if they don't do what you, what you yeah. have mandated that they do. Right. And, you know, is it enough? Would I like to do more? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that I look at it and the way the world works is you have to be taking significant steps, but you will never get the whole thing at one time. Mm -hmm. So. We, we, I, we think this is a significant, these are significant steps. We should, you know, go forth and be happy and actually get <laughs> this done, and then we're gonna start all over again. Right. We'll go to the next step. Right, and I think that that's super important, of course, always to, yeah. to uh, remind our viewers that, you know, the work that you do is, mm -hmm. it, it never ends at a right. particular right. point. Even when, even if your hands are raised in triumph over right. some recent legislation or something like that, there's it's not perfect, and there's going right. to be more, and there's always more to more be to done do. from there. So. Of course, yeah. Um, okay, I I just have one last thing to ask you about, which is that uh, it also says here that the act will ensure that consumers pay the lowest available cost for a prescription drug at the pharmacy counter. Mm -hmm. What does that lowest available cost mean? So w what that simply means is that if you go, you will go to the, when you go to the pharmacy counter to get um, a drug, your, you have a, a, a benefit and you have a copay or you have an out-of-pocket mm -hmm. and you also have the cost of the drug without those things. Mm -hmm. This requires that you be told what the lowest price of is and that that is offered to you. So it's, it's, Shocking to know, but in there are a number of cases, not just a few, that your copay is greater than the actual cost of the drug. Is that and right? That is, is something that, right? that we feel should be addressed. <laughs> well, right. let's just let's just make sure people understand that and very well. You're saying it is not rare. Right. In fact, it it can happen with some regularity that people will pay a copay for a prescription drug right. and it costs, that right. copay right. exceeds the cost of the drug. Right. Now it gets very complicated, right? Because we all have these deductibles. And so the question is, well, if I don't pay that, if I, if I don't pay the copay, for instance, or the out-of-pocket, do I, but I pay for the lower price, what happens? And so we in this bill have said, you don't get to be charged more because more. you're not meeting your deductible. Great, great. Well, all of this sounds good. And you have, uh, you cautioned us, you know, right from the outset that, uh, you know, this is past one of the two chambers and it's likely to be in a different form by the time it gets to be law, which we hope it right. will be. Right. Um, but I really appreciate you taking the time to, again, kind of go nicely into the weeds on this. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, but let me ask you, um, I said at the outset, this is important to you. It's also clear from the way that you've just spoken about it, this is important to you. Um, what has your role been up to this point? How much is this is the is your own imprint on this legislation do you feel and then what's your role going forward obviously the house will do what they're going to do and then there will be further steps to take so just tell us a little bit about what you've done 
for this so far and what you expect to be doing sure. in the future? So in 2019, I sponsored a bill that um, was written by my team and I, we worked on this together, with input from many, many, many stakeholders over many months, and we put together this bill, the first version of the PACT Act. This se session, and part of what happened is COVID, COVID came. COVID came, right. Um, so this session. Thought we were gonna have a whole conversation without mentioning that word, didn't you? No, I know. no, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Delta Cron, <definitely. laughs> um, we, we re we resubmitted it and we updated it. So I am the sponsor of this bill, my team, my incredible team um, wrote this. Um, and so, and then we ushered it forward. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also the chair of healthcare financing for the Senate. So that gives me some opportunity to have bills I care about move. <laughs> right. Not always, not always, but right, you know. But, yeah. um, so that is what the role that I've had. Going forward, um, you know, I, I work with my co-chair on the House to talk to him about what are the issues of moving this bill and how can we do that. If they do move it and there, there is a House version, then I would think that as the chair of healthcare financing, I would probably be, you know, um, the conference committee. Right, uh, as we committee. mentioned before, right. probably. Right. And, I, you this. know, I would, and I, nothing is ever guaranteed, but that would be my role. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, again, I just wanted to clarify, I wasn't that sure myself, although I did have, have the sense. Um, this is this is basically the work of you yes. you and your your team. Right. Um, this is yeah, and, and it, it's the work of my team, and and it's and it's my work, and it's also work that has gone through numbers of iterations to try and get as many people to the table, and as many people comfortable as we th think. You know, mm -hmm. so this represents what I believe is important and will help move it along. It doesn't totally reflect what I, Cindy Friedman, would like to see in it. Absolutely. Sausage everywhere. Right. Sausage right? everywhere. And, and that's the and way it works. That's just, yeah. you know, obviously. So, but uh, again, great to spend this time with you to talk about something, again, near and dear to your heart, but also which you literally have drafted, again, with lots of input. Yes. Um, and we will be very interested to see how things move from here. And we'll be talking to you about it further. Um, but for today, we are, we are out of time. Um, thanks again. This has been really, really good. I appreciate it very much. Well, I do too, and I really appreciate the opportunity to actually talk about the yeah. content. Yeah, I agree. I think so. <laughs> Let's do it again. Yes, absolutely. Um, of course, she is Cindy Friedman, our state senator, and I am James Milan. This has been Talk of the Town. We've been talking about the PACT Act, and let us hope that we are talking about the final legislation <laughs> at some point in the not-too-distant future. For Talk of the Town and for Cindy Friedman, we appreciate her time. We appreciate yours. I'm James Milan. Thanks for joining us.